All right, good morning. I'm glad you're here, and the Lord is glad you're here. If you would, open your Bibles to John chapter 8. I want us to read verses 31 through 47. John chapter 8, verses 31 through 47. John 8 belongs to the section of John's Gospel where Jesus is being confronted by and is in active debate with the Jews, as John calls them. Specifically here in verses 31 through 47, the debate is about about the Jews being the children of Abraham. Hear now the word of the true and living God. Beginning in verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. Who is it that you, how is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen from my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, We were not born in fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Let us pray. Father, you, through Christ, identified that there are two humanities, two families that have two fathers as their head. We pray that you would show us clearly through the words of Jesus this morning your family and what it means to be in your family and what it means to call you father. We pray this in Jesus name. Amen. If you plant a seed in good soil, there's a high probability that it will grow to full potential. However, if you take the same seed and you plant it in bad soil, things will not go well. Children are like plants. A good father, like good soil, can help a child reach their full potential. However, since dad is destiny, a bad father can choke even the best seed. There's a story that's told of a psychologist who was called to a military academy. The young men were struggling with their lessons, with their study hours, struggling with their drills. And so what the psychologist did was he evaluated a number of factors, but one of the things he did was he He wanted to see the mail that was coming in. And so letters 
that had been sent from the fathers of these young boys seemed to reveal the cause of the struggle. One father wrote his son, I expect you to obey. Another said, if you are expelled from school, you needn't come home. Still another said, I'll send you to an insane asylum if you are sent home. And another said, I'll cut you off without a dime if you disgrace the family. But there was one. It was couched in uh, very sparse language. It just said, steady, my boy, steady, father. So the father believed his son capable of the demands that were put upon him. What was needed was just to be steady. And so also in spiritual matters, there are two kinds of children in this world, each with their respective fathers. The devil has his family, his children. God the Father has his family with his children. And the devil, well, he sends mail too. He whispers, he says, you can't obey God perfectly, so why try? He says, God won't let you into his heaven. He says, God's going to cut you off. But our Father in heaven has written 66 love letters. And then on top of that, he sent Jesus to tell us that he loves us and that Well, through Him, we are enabled to steadfastly follow Christ. Jesus, in our text this morning, is communicating truth about God. That God, as our Father, brings us freedom to be all that our Father desires for us to be. You have this back and forth that is taking place between Jesus and the Jews. Uh, We're told in verse 31 that these are Jews who had believed in him. But the way this is written in the original language indicates these were not people who continued to believe in him. It was just kind of like a a one and done thing. We might say that they walked an aisle or they said a prayer. You know, they they filled out a card. uh, And so they thought, you know what? Hey, you know, I've done, I've checked the box. I've done what I'm supposed to do. And now, you know, I can kind of do things my way. It wasn't a commitment. It wasn't a devotion to Jesus. They simply uh, believed, and that was kind of it. And it's to these individuals that Jesus, well, he's he's got a very stern message to them. They claim that they have one Father, even God. But before they get there, you kind of walk through the text, and one of the things that they do, well, in verse 33, they argued that they were who they were based on their uh, descendant. Verse 33, they said, we are offspring of Abraham. Your translation may say, we are seed of Abraham. We're Abraham's seed. That's a, a good translation, too. And Jesus, he doesn't dispute that. He doesn't deny it. In verse 37, he affirms it. I know you are the offspring of Abraham. Yeah. I recognize, Jesus is saying, that you are physically descended from Abraham. We might say that there was a biological connection, a genetic connection. Yeah, they could trace their lineage all the way back to Abraham. However, Jesus indicates that based on their actions, they're not really behaving like the offspring of Abraham. Their connection is just that, merely physical, nothing further. The rest of verse 37, yet you seek to kill me because my words find no place in you. He'll go on, he'll say, you're not doing the works of Abraham. And so with the response that Jesus gives, in verse 37, the the Jews here, they double down. And they claim that, um, yes, they, uh, verse 39, excuse me, they answered him, Abraham is our father. They insist upon this. We're, we're Abraham's offspring, but we're also, we, he's, he's our father. They seem to be missing the point because Jesus has just said in verse 38, he's drawn this contrast between my father, 
and our English translations capitalize that because it's talking about God the Father, versus your Father. He's already hinting at what he's going to say plainly when we get to verse 44. There's different fathers going on here. And, and so here, verse 39, is where uh, the, the Jews, they again double down and they say, we have Abra Abraham as our father. And so Jesus responds to that and says, look, if you are truly of Abraham, you would be doing the works Abraham did. Specifically, that would include faith in God and, and here, uh, again, more specifically, faith in the one that the Father has sent, which is Jesus. And then, again, along the way, Jesus is pointing out here uh, verse 41, you're doing the works your father did. Hmm, there it is again. Your father, your father. There is this uh, slight at Jesus, kind of subtle here. And they say, uh, we were not born of fornication. And again, that seems to be their way of slighting Jesus. Kind of hinting at their misunderstanding about the virgin birth. There's some kind of shady backstory here with you, Jesus, that without directly saying it, they're saying, you were born in fornication, not us. We have one Father, even God. There's the claim. God is our Father. And Jesus very pointedly explains, if that's true, here's what it would look like, and we'll, we'll, go, we'll go through those here in a moment. And then, again, he tells them plainly who their father is. Verse 44, you are of your father, the devil. And you can just imagine uh, that, uh, well, everything broke loose at that point. But I, before, again, we, we kind of walk through these, I do want to, this is an important point that Jesus is making here. You see, it's one thing to claim something and it's another thing to back it up, right? There's the claim, but what's the evidence of this claim that you're making? The Jews here are claiming that God is their father, and yet their actions prove otherwise. You're seeking to kill me, the one who's been sent by the Father, Jesus says. Their actions are proving that while you may claim that God is your father, you actually have a different father, and you apparently don't even realize that the devil is your father. And in a similar way, there are many today who make a similar claim, perhaps even the same claim. They will claim that th there's only one God. Th they'll make the claim about uh, even calling God their father, and yet their actions betray a different father. Their actions actually prove that no, they don't really believe that God is their father. They refuse to do the things that Jesus said must be done. They refuse to follow Scripture in, in all its clarity. It can be kind of the big sins, but this thing crawls right down into a person's lap to those commonly tolerated sins like gossip and little white lies, impatience, ingratitude, here, the, the Jews mentioned fornication. That's a big one, but guess what the root of fornication is? Lust. Ooh. And so, again, there's the claim, but then there's also, well, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. What do your actions show? And again, it, it's very easy to point out to the world, but we, first and foremost, must check our own hearts, brothers and sisters. Specific to this context, Jesus indicates that one of, the, one of the ultimate tests of whether or not a person truly can call upon God as their father is what do they think about the son? Verse 42, Jesus said, if God were your father, you would love me. What do you do with Jesus? Do you love Jesus? You cannot claim God as your father and slight his son. No, no, that's just what we see here. That's just what the Jewish people were doing in Jesus' day. 
They had believed, but it, it never actually went further beyond that. Beyond just seemingly a mere mental assent. It didn't take root in their heart. They weren't truly of God. That's why they didn't understand. Why they could not bear to hear His Word. What is your response to the word, uh, the words of Christ? Again, another, another key question when it comes to claiming that God is your Father. What do you do with Jesus? If you do not love Jesus, you may claim that God is your Father, but He really is not. Jesus does not mince words here. He pulls no punches. Verse 44, you are of your father, the devil. The crowds that were standing before him, he says at the end of verse 47, the reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. They are of their father, the devil. You've heard the the well-known maxim, actions speak louder than words, right? Right? Well, that's sim- that simply is the case here. They're, the actions of the Jews is proof positive of their sonship. It's proof positive of who their father is. And their father here is the devil. It is important to note here that these are not pagan idolaters. These are not people who are just evil to the max. These are people who, by and large, are probably very moral people. They, they had the law of God, and especially with the religious leaders, they were, they were uh, tedious. They were very careful in their obedience to the law. However, that righteousness was a self-righteousness. That morality was their way of trying to earn their way into the promised land. Which is instructive for us as well. A person can be very moral today. They don't have to be a pagan idolater. They don't have to you know, make a god and bow down to it. Quite frankly, many of our gods today are the almighty dollar and the stuff that we accumulate No, a person does not need to be so grossly immoral and evil to the max. They they don't have to be uh, Hitler reborn. They can be very moral and still still have the devil as their father. Why is that? Again, what do you do with Jesus? See, rejection of the Son means that you remain of the devil. You remain under His rule and His reign. You remain a part of the kingdom of darkness. You remain, well, we can now start walking through some of the characteristics of the devil's children. And what does it look like? If we notice verse 37 here, Jesus says one of the marks is, My word finds no place in you. The end of verse 37. Christ's word finds no place in you a child of the devil. Externally, again, we're we're offspring of Abraham. And Jesus says, yeah, I know that. I know you've got this physical lineage, this physical descent. But there's no spiritual reality here. My word finds no place in, in you, in your heart, in your mind. Again, what... What does a person do with the Word of God? How they respond to the Word of God will be indicative of who their father is. Verse 34, Jesus says, Everyone who practices sin is a slave of sin. Slavery to sin is a clear indicator, a marker of a child of the devil, who their father is. And this is, this is not just merely a single act of sin. That a, a child of God, I mean, we're not perfect. We, we uh, fall into sin. We, we stumble. We trip up. This is, Jesus says here, it's the one who practices sin. 
One who makes it the habitual practice to sin. That is what slavery to sin is. In the book of 1 John, which seems to be John's uh, further elaboration, maybe an epilogue to his gospel that he wrote. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, he unpacks this a bit more. He says, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. That's just what Jesus said, right? For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. You hear it, don't you? What's your practice? If it's one where you are practicing sin and you are not truly seeking repentance and and you're not putting sin to death, that's a clear indication of slavery to sin and who your father is. But the one who, in whom God's seed abides, and who, who is actually making it a practice to put sin to death, you realize you can't keep on sinning. You're not sinless, but you are learning to sin less. Again, this is one who has been born of God. By this, verse 10, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Ah, there's the other aspect of this. Not just the negative statement of not practicing sin, but then the other side of this is practicing righteousness. Which is more than just being a a good, honest, sincere, moral person. Kind of that moralism today. Practicing righteousness recognizes, first and foremost, I have been clothed with the righteousness of God, and I'm not trying to be found before God with a righteousness of my own. That's what moralism is. I've been clothed with Christ's righteousness, and now I seek to put into practice the righteousness that God has revealed in His Word. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Again, this is slavery to sin and the contrast here between them. Between that and freedom, which we'll talk about in a moment. So God's word, Christ's word, finds no place within the heart of a child of the devil. They are in slavery to sin. And now verse 42 Coming back to John 8, verse 42, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. Which again implies, at the minimum, there's no love for Christ. No love for Christ. No desire for him. A failure to recognize and acknowledge. He has been sent by the Father. This is the one who has heard and seen from the Father. And indeed, if we see him, we have seen the Father. There's no love for him, no desire for him. That's what marks, again, a child of the devil. Jesus goes on in verse 43. He says, why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. Here, another characteristic is there's no understanding, no hearing of God's word. And there are any number of causes to that, but one is, if you are under the family of the evil one, if you are a child of the devil, he is your father, one of the things, he's not a good father, right? He's he's the worst father. His slavery is a harsh slavery. In 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, Paul explains one of the causes to why there would be no hearing or understanding. He says, in their case, the God of this world, and that's Paul's way of talking about the devil, he has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The devil doesn't want you seeing the light of the glory of the gospel of God. And so he blinds you. You think, you, imagine a father who puts out the eyes of his children. That's what the devil does. 
There's no love, only hatred. He hates us, and so he wants to keep us blind. He wants to keep the unbeliever trapped in darkness and in his kingdom. Verse 44, the fi- as we come back to John 8, the final characteristic here. Jesus says that you are of your father the devil. Your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. You know what the, the devil as a father desires is lies. And guess what? His children will believe those lies. Again, they've been blinded. Uh, we could also talk about uh, hardness of heart, fallen in mind, futile in thinking, all these other characteristics. But what the devil does is he presents falsehood, he presents lies, and his children end up loving those lies. They embrace them, they live according to them. That is what is the desire of the father of the children of the devil. It's his native language, it becomes their native language. Is it any wonder that we see so much confusion in the world today when so many are still bound in the kingdom of darkness? So much confusion, so much falsehood about who a person is and their identity and and all these different things that we see today. Where does that come from? It does not come from God. Contrary to what much of progressive Christianity wants people to believe. And will utilize Scripture, even distort Scripture, press it into service in order to try and convince people that that is actually a good thing. When all it is is confusion and falsehood and lies and deception and, and everything from the evil one. And so the language of the father of lies Well, that's what the children learn to speak as well. And they end up loving it. Which is just, that's part of the twisted nature of sin as well. Is it distorts our affection so that we love the wrong things. That's the bad news. That's the starting point. By the way, that's where all of us once lived. And we loved it. But the reason the Son of God appeared, we read it just a moment ago, right? Was to destroy the works of the devil. He came to destroy the works of this awful, hate-filled father, which is the devil. And so the Son of the Father, God the Father, came in order to undo the works of the evil one. He does that through the cross. He came, he lived the sinless life that we could never live, went to the cross and died in our place for our sins, our sins placed on him so that his righteousness could be credited to us. That's the great sweet exchange of the gospel. Our sins to him, his righteousness to us. And he dies on the cross in order to forgive all of our sins by his blood. And now that we have, we've been given new spiritual life, Through the Holy Spirit, by the grace of God. And now, what does it look like to be one of God's children and to be able to call Him Father? Well, whereas prior to our conversion, there was no place for God's Word in our hearts or in our minds, Jesus says, verse 31, John 8, 31, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Whereas his word found no place before, now we abide in that word. We live in it. We dwell in it. We live according to his word. We allow him to live in us. His word, his life, that becomes our guide for how we are to live our lives, for Christian conduct in this world. And abiding in Christ's word, that is proof, number one, that we are truly his disciples. But it also is proof of who our Father is, which is God the Father. It proves that we are abiding in the Son. 
In the second place, whereas before we were slaves of sin, now there's freedom. Uh, Notice verse uh, 32. You will know the truth. The truth will set you free. Verse 36. So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Free completely. Free totally. Free from our bondage, our slavery to sin. Now we are slaves of Christ. That's a high, noble position. We are slaves of righteousness, seeking to practice righteousness like we talked about a moment ago. The Son of God sets you free, free indeed, free completely, free from sin. Also free from that hamster wheel of works where you're trying to do. There's a lot lot of people think that what a person tries to do is like your, your life is balancing scales. And if what you're trying to do is put enough good works to balance out the bad works. And if you, hopefully you have enough good works to balance out those good works, uh, the bad works, so that at the end, God can, he'll let you into his heaven. That is not the way it works. That's damnable heresy. Period. Full stop. You can't do enough good to overcome the evil and the sin that you've done. Your balance will always be evil, but for Christ, and but for the grace of God, and but for the forgiveness of sin that that is brought to us by the blood of Christ. That's what freedom looks like. Freedom off of the hamster wheel of works. We can't do enough. Indeed, our, our good works, the prophet says, are nothing more than filthy rags. freedom. We come back to verse 42, another characteristic here. Again, if if God were your father, you would love me. Well, guess what? We, We do love the father. He is our father, and therefore we love the son. Love for Christ is another characteristic of one who is a child of God. You love Jesus more than any other earthly ties. I've said it before. I'll continue to say it. Look, I I love my wife that is, that is the closest relationship that I have on this earth with another human being is with my wife. I love my wife, but here's the thing. I love Jesus more than her. And she loves Jesus more than me, and neither one of us is jealous because she knows and I know neither one of us could die for the other. Christ died for us. Do you love him? Do you love him? Love for Christ is evidence of you are a child of the Father. You love Him more than anyone else on earth, and why not? He's the only one who could and did die on the cross for your sins to save you from a devil's hell and from everything of the sin and the grave and everything else that goes along with that. This is related here to Uh, what we've been talking about with the word, but uh, we saw that in in verse 43 that when it comes to being a a child of the devil, there's no understanding, no hearing of God's word. And and verse 37 was related to that. He said, you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you? Well, now for the child of God, Christ's word has found its place in us. It's related to abiding in Christ's word. His word has found a place in us. We, we are willing, we desire to read His word, to study His word, to put it into practice, to follow it, to live it out. That's what it means for His word to find its place in our lives. That's another clear indicator that we are God's children. And then, finally, whereas before we loved lies, now, verse 32, you will know the truth. You know the truth. And, and because you know the truth, you recognize what you used to love were lies. They were falsehood. But the truth, which is in Christ, the truth of the gospel, has found its place in you. And also, because you know the truth, and since truth is that which corresponds to reality, it ought to be that Christians can truly recognize Reality for what it is. 
that there's no confusion about the way things are among Christians. We're able to identify error, and we're able to point others to truth. Because, as Jesus says, you know the truth. Two families. Two sets of children here. The other thing that Jesus provides us with here is a, a corrective for a, uh, a popular belief among people today. There, there are those who believe that there's this universal fatherhood of God. You know, we're all just God's children anyway. And it is true that, yes, all of us are the creation of God. He is, uh, he's the creator for all of us. It's true that we're all made in His image. And it's true that we all live, move, and have our being in this world. But as we see from our text, and this, again, is just... This is just what Jesus says. It's taught by Jesus himself. There are two families. There are those who can call upon God as father, and then there are those whose father is the devil, and they may not even realize it because of the deception. Those fellow image bearers, brothers and sisters, are not to be hated, we are not to uh, think less of them. We are to recognize that they too are a fellow image bearer who are prisoners of war. And what, what they need is the gospel. They need the truth of the gospel. You see the evangelistic component of this. Look, if, everybody, if, if there is this universal fatherhood of God and everybody's just a child of God, what would be the point in going and preaching the gospel to them? But if we recognize just what Jesus says here, that there are children of the devil that inhabit this world, they need the gospel. They need to be set free from this slavery to sin and, and from this father who has blinded them. And and so, brothers and sisters, let us, let us search our hearts. Let us shine the light of Christ's word upon our heart. Examine our own hearts, examine our own motives as to why we do and say the things that we do. We allow Scripture to expose all of our sin and seek to live for Christ in all that we do. Let's commit this to prayer. Father God, we... We thank you so much for Jesus. So grateful for his, his clear teaching. And Father, we pray that you would continue to enlighten the eyes of our hearts so that we can clearly see the truth of your word, that we can clearly see the way things really are in this world. And that, well, we would be about our Father's business. We pray that you would help us with this by your Holy Spirit who lives within us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As you search your heart this morning, my friend, You need to soberly think about the things that Jesus is telling you in his word this morning. To clearly evaluate the things that we've been talking about. What, what do you think of Jesus? What have you done with Jesus? Do, do you claim to believe in God? What, what is the evidence of that? What is the proof of that? Have you turned away from sin? Have you confessed Jesus Christ as Lord? Have you been obedient to Him in all things, even to the point of being baptized, immersed in water, have all your sins washed away by the blood of Jesus to receive the Holy Spirit and to be raised to live this new life with Christ? In a moment, we'll be led in song by Gary. 
And that is your opportunity, my friend, to come forward and express how you desire to do these things. To put Christ on. To live with Him. To live for Him. To truly show that you not only love the Father, but you love the Son as well. My brothers, my sisters, those of us who have done that, the Christian walk is one where we are always evaluating our hearts. And and maybe as we've walked through these various characteristics this morning, there's some area that was exposed by the words of Christ. You know, when Gary leaves us, it's your opportunity to come forward and share the things that are on your heart where we can surround you with love and lift you up in prayer to our Father in heaven. Maybe it's something of a personal nature in a private setting. One of our shepherds will be available in the conference room. Make your way to the conference room and do the same thing there that we do here. Surround you with love, lift you up in prayer to our Father in heaven. Maybe it's not specifically related to what we've been talking about this morning, but maybe it could be something that is uh, spiritual or mental, emotional, physical, that you want to share with the body, you want the prayers of the church. Uh, We can help you with that this morning as well. The lesson is yours. The invitation is open. Won't you come right now while we stand and as we sing?